the post-pandemic world lays out this really kind of remarkable once in a century sort of opportunity to completely rethink and redesign not just the workplace, but the way we work. The old rules have been thrown out the window by force. And that gives us all an opportunity in the next few months to come up with some uh, new rules. Uh, we've learned that that the pandemic has created the preconditions for innovation. How do we keep that going? How do we figure out a better way of working together? Uh, I've got three great business leaders here with different perspectives on this issue to uh, discuss this with. And I think Mahal, with the 17% figure, has given us a provocative uh, place to start from. It's important to remember that there are also a, a, a lot of people, and the numbers I've seen show a majority of people, who do want to return to the office in some form. So it, uh, if I can start, and let me quickly introduce all three of you, raise your hand so people know who is who. Uh, we have Hyatt President and CEO Mark Hoplamazian, uh, great, Emphasis President Ravi Kumar, uh, and uh, Dr. Frida Pali, who is the CEO of Pymetrics, which focuses on bias-free talent management. Thank you all for being here. Ravi, let me go to you first. In a world where the, uh, the majority of people want more flexibility to work from home, but still want an office to go to, what does that hybrid model look like? Thank you. Thank you, Alan, for this opportunity. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to keep this uh, comments brief and we will reflect on what the consequences are. Uh, there is a confluence of forces which are going to drive the future of work. Uh, and I'm going to highlight a few important ones. Uh, the first and foremost, work is going to get very modular. It was getting modular. Ironically, the health crisis is going to accelerate it. We're going to have enterprises being platforms where work is orchestrated. And work is going to get disconnected from enterprises. Jobs which create work are going to get disconnected from work. And uh, you're going to see democratization of work. And it has consequences, and we'll discuss about it. Hybrid workplaces are going to be real. Hybrid workplaces will differ. The hybridity was, will differ based on the kind of industry, the kind of work or function, or the kind of company you are working in and the culture of the firm. We are going to draw from the strength of the physical past. We are going to draw from the strength of the virtual current, and we're going to define a future which is going to be very productive. We need social capital from physical interactions. Work is actually going to get very distributed, and I think hotels are going to be a huge pivot to create distributed workplace. That's one of, one of the consequences. We'll discuss about it. Uh, even before the health crisis happened, there was an embrace of AI, machine learning into workplaces. So in many ways, problem solving, which was an endeavor for humans at work, uh, that will get transitioned to machines and the human endeavor will be problem finding. The, need, the cognitive need of uh, human endeavor is going to be very different in workplaces. Uh, the last uh, force I want to talk about, uh, these are the four important ones, there are many we could discuss, is the shrinkage of the life of skills. And that shrinkage of the life of skills was because of digitization, and in some sense that's got accelerated. And as that shrinkage happens, we are going to find the linear, linear equation between education and work blurring. You're going to see a non-linear equation there. Work and education are going to get intertwined, and we're going to see lifelong learning as an integral part of uh, workplaces. Uh, Ravi, there's so much there to talk about. Thank you for laying the table for us. You've given us a rich set of subjects. I want to ask you one thing before I, I, I move on to uh, Frida. When you say work is, is getting modular, can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know... Um, uh, with digital platforms, Alan, uh, you could you could break work into components and you could distribute it beyond physical workplaces. In some sense, that experiment and ha experimentation happened when we were forced to work virtually. I was talking to a customer today morning, uh, a large telco. 
which actually said that 32,000 people who do customer care potentially will not come back to a physical place. And that's because they created a digital platform, integrated it during this process. And now that they're used to it, they're going to distribute that work to a physical and a virtual place. So it's, it's going to get modular. What does that mean? Gig workers could potentially be a part of corporate workforces. And um, that's one, one, uh, you know, one consequence of what, uh, what happens when work gets modular. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are many, and many that, such uh, interesting inferences. And that, of course, has huge uh, implications for all the things you mentioned afterwards, the, how you create a work culture, how you ensure uh, appropriate skilling, care for employees. So we'll come back to that. But Frida, if I could, uh, if I could turn to you, um, uh, it, this also has huge implications for recruiting talent, hiring talent, managing talent. The whole talent equation seems to me has changed pretty dramatically by distributed work. Yeah, absolutely, Alan. Uh, and thanks for asking these important questions. So, I mean, I think that, you know, we've seen a number of different trends arise in our work. One, I think, um, and I'm not sure if it was accelerated by the pandemic or some of the factors that Ravi was talking about, but um, there really seems to be a growing focus on soft skills over pedigree. And I think it does have something to do with what Ravi was saying, where sort of, you know, there's a short shelf life for hard skills. Um, and there was a recent study by Deloitte that said that, you know, 92% of folks um, think that soft skills are as or more important than uh, hard skills. 89% of failed workers lack the soft skills and 75% say they have a hard time identifying these in uh, in recent grads. So I think that, you know, and, and I think that's increasingly true when, you know, the human elements of, you know, empathy, connection, everything else are so critical to making this distributed workforce function properly, right? That we're really grasping for what are the right soft skills? How do we measure them? And so on. The, the other thing I'll say about soft skills is they really allow for more equalization of the workforce. So unfortunately, the pandemic, as we all know, has impacted women and communities of color, um, you know, in a much more disproportionate way. And so as we look to the recovery to bring some of these folks back into the equation, um, we may need to focus more on, you know, the soft skill component. If, for example, there's a gap in some sort of, a, you know, a resume, which is what we would we would normally look for. So I, they really do allow for greater equalization of the workforce. The second trend, which is obvious because we're all on Zoom and not meeting in person, is just the increased di digitization, right? And how does that impact, you know, hiring? There's all, obviously a lot of talent management issues that come into play, um, remote employee surveillance, all sorts of stuff, right? And I think that that plays into this broader, you know, sort of narrative out there that um, technology, while it's a wonderful thing, it can allow us to all connect also has a, you know, a downside, um, which is particularly manifest in sort of the articles that we read around AI and AI bias. And as Robbie said, AI is hugely um, you know, sort of interwoven into a lot of the digital tools that we use, be it for hiring, talent management, reskilling, all sorts of things. And so how do we ensure that these platforms are not perpetuating bias, um, but can actually mitigate some of that? And so look, there's a broad discussion on this topic right now. Everything from, you know, industry groups arguing that we can do it ourselves, that the industry just needs better, you know, sort of standards, you know, then all the way to, you know, there needs to be greater federal regulation of, of you know, what they call high risk, um, a, you know, high risk implementations of AI, which include a, a lot of employment use cases. So it's a it's a very rich dialogue that we're having around, you know, um, how technology is impacting us now. Uh, both in a positive way and also warding off some of the potential yeah. uh, negatives that people are most fearful of. Yeah, I want to come back to yeah, that, but, I, but, I, but I, Mark, I'd like to go Mark, to you. Mark, I'd like to go to you. I, I'm getting an echo here, folks. I hope no one else is. But uh, let me go. Let me go to you first uh, uh, b before we go b back to that, Mark, because I don't think anything has changed more dramatically than business travel. Uh, I mean, all of us on this call were probably road warriors in 2019 and then shifted to being homebodies in 2020. And uh, the, the surveys we've done of CEOs uh, suggest they think we are never going back to 2019. 
uh, that's got to be tough for you to hear, Mark. But tell me how you're thinking about that. Is that correct? Uh, what's your projection and what does it mean for the travel industry? Um, thanks, Alan. And um, it's, a, it's such a pleasure to be here with Ravi and Frida. Um, and we've worked with uh, Frida's company in the past. So a lot of what she was talking about, especially the first seg segment of what she was referring to, resonates deeply with me. So I'm so happy that you're here with us, Frida. <laughs> um, yeah, business travel has changed. Yeah. Uh, uh, the 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 um, the fact that is that we will not go back to 2019, and I don't mean that in the context of what our revenue base is going to going to, going to look like. What I mean is, however, and a lot of people are now making these grand prognostications, mostly technology executives, by the way, who might be promoting their own uh, technology platforms. Just saying, um, are making these broad <laughs> predictions about how dramatically. Um, the uh, incidence of business travel is going to drop. Um, and I think that the fact is that in that context, their reference point is what business used to look like in 20, you know, pre-pandemic. And I don't think that th that's the right context. I mean, in the same way that none of us could possibly have understood and imagined what our lives would look like and, and what the mental, psychological, and emotional strains that we would be under given COVID-19 pre-COVID, we could have not imagined it. It would not be possible to actually, from an empathy or experiential perspective, understand what that feels like. In like manner, when we're, when we're past the pandemic and we can actually get together with family and friends in an unconstrained way, likewise, you cannot now know what that's going to feel like. And I think that's going to be, there's going to be such a reversion to trying to, to reconnect. And a lot of these, uh, you heard Robbie's language, modular disconnected, distributed, democratized. These are all words that are that are pulling things apart and isolating yeah. them. And there's, yeah. there's an atomization that's going on. That's concurrent with a feeling of personal isolation. So I, I say those things primarily to frame how I think about it. The way I think about it is, yes, there are certain categories of travel, business travel, that are going to decline. Some will decline significantly, there are other dimensions of business travel that will expand. And most importantly, when we actually get to a post-pandemic world and we have these very different experiences than um, what, what we can imagine at the moment, um, I think that there will be many new use cases. Many companies that we work with, uh, corporations, they are, in some ways, they are, uh, there, there's two narratives around whether productivity is higher or lower. I've talked to a number of CEOs who say it's it's a it's a false positive. It appears that productivity is much higher, but they're really worried about the fact that you know interstitial time at home really means that you're going out for a walk and not really working the same number of hours. Um, there's also the question about whether the mental health impact of remote working is actually allowing people to stay productive in a in a healthy way, and what are the medium to long term consequences of that? So. There are definitely several narratives around whether productivity is here to stay at a higher level. Um, and um, but so what I, what I would say is that as we move into this uh, next phase, I think that there will be new use cases, companies that want to gather their employees together per market to create that connective tissue, to create the culture that, that Ravi mentioned, which is so essential. Um, and and really bring back a human dimension to what work means. And and people talk about the dignity of work. Um, it's it's sometimes hard to just sort of gain that sense of satisfaction and dignity if you're completely remote and feeling isolated. So I think that there will be new use cases. My my general prediction is that we will get back to a similar level of total travel for business, but it, it will look different. It's the composition of it will, it yeah. will be different. You won't yeah. see people doing day trips to Tokyo for a meeting anymore. So that'll go yeah. away. But, yeah. Well, I, I think that gets to a really interesting issue that I'd love to get, uh, dive in a little deeper. I will tell you, Mark, by the way, if it, if it uh, gives you any comfort, I got my first vaccine shot last week and I booked my first trip the next day. So, <laughs> so there is a, we are eager to get on, a, get on uh, planes and, and, and go places. But Robbie, uh, 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 well, let me ask all three of you this question, really, because if we are moving to a hybrid world, where 
co-location is about collaboration, innovation, culture, uh, you know, creating the opportunity for that social engagement, which is important to us as social animals. But focused work happens in a distributed way. What happens to the office? I mean, it makes no sense. And I speak as a, the CEO of a company that has some nice real estate uh, uh, in New York City, but it makes no sense to have expensive space in New York City or San Francisco or Chicago if you're going to go there one or two days a week to collaborate together. So how is that going to work? And Mark, is there an opportunity for the hotel business to maybe step up and become the collaboration center or the innovation center? Ravi, you first. Yeah, so, uh, so Alan, you know, Mark and Frida had great points. In fact, uh, I agree with what Mark said, which is about the, the fact that uh, you need social capital to be drawn by, from physical interactions. And, uh, and already businesses are starting to say that they are exhausting that social capital, which they drew, drew from the physical past. Uh, so there is always going to be uh, physical interactions as a part of the mix. That doesn't go away. The composition is going to change. Each function is going to uh, deliberate in a different way. The template is going to be different, but that doesn't take away physical interaction. Um, you know, the few points I made initially, there are consequences to it. And the consequences are the following. Um, the level of hybridness will change from workload to workload, depending on the function you are in. Um, if you have networked organizational structures, you could go more hybrid. If you have hierarchical structures, you need more physical interaction. Uh, if you have close-knit communities, you draw much more social capital. Uh, so there are a variety of these things which will yeah. come into picture on how hybridness will define. The we, second yeah. bit I would say is gig workers would be real in corporate world because, as I said, work is going to go very modular. We have an opportunity to make it much more diverse and inclusive because work will move away from rich urban settings to rural parts of America and other parts of the world. And uh, the cognitive in workplaces is going to be very different. We're going to see non-STEM uh, non disciplines. And education yeah. and work, as I said, will intertwine. And that will give an opportunity for you know, learn, learning to learn, learning to unlearn, learning to relearn on a continual basis. All of that yeah, and, is going to change yeah. the template on what we do and market, in the future. And a new business opportunity for hotels, potentially, right? Yeah, I think that's that's probably right. Um, but your question about what, what's the future of the office, I do think that there's a role. We're we're thinking about uh, creating uh, multiple designs of how uh, of days of of what schedules look like, so that we can create um, dedicated time during certain hours, so that we know that people can, are can be together and collaborate. We believe yeah. that um, it won't yeah. be five days a week anymore. We think that people will have flexible schedules. So. I don't think I think the five day work week nine to five in an office is gone, probably forever. Yeah. But I, I do think that setting it up so that you create the conditions for that um, that collaboration, the innovation process, we're, we're effectively moving our entire way of working to a more agile. And I'm now specifically talking about the same agile model that software developers use, model which requires cross functional engagement. Now you can do some of that hybrid. But the power of being able to ideate in person is really, really significant. Uh, Frida, last quick comment. Last quick comment. We want balance, Alan. You know what I mean? And as a working parent that's constantly freaking out, is my kid going to, you know, <laughs> scream in the middle of this uh, conference that I'm doing? I think it's just about creating that balance back and having some office in our lives. It's great. And Mahal, I know you had a couple of questions from the audience that, that we didn't get to, and I apologize uh, for that, but maybe we can get to them later in the program. All good. All good. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much to the panel.